We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we're at the innovation stage today. If you are around the stage, please do come to the stage because you will not be able to hear any of our amazing panelists without actually being connected to the headset. So if you are around and you're kind of finished your networking, feel free to sit down in one of the chairs here so you can listen to what's up next. We've heard a lot about startups, the primary market issuance with some investors earlier today. And now we're going to go more in depth into the secondary market talks around, let's say, crypto exchanges and everything that can be done post launch and the real importance behind the crypto exchanges that you see uh, today. Um, after that, we have a few more panels around adoption, education, and the like, so stay tuned. There's also some amazing things happening on the main stage. Feel free to go around some of the booths. A lot is still happening. And of course, we have the gala dinner that is starting at 7 p.m. Well, starting. It'll start a little bit later in uh, the Burj Khalifa, but you'll be able to grab your buses at 7 p.m. right downstairs as you enter the building. All right, then without further ado, uh, I'll welcome our panelists to the stage. Sandra, I think the stage is all yours for the new horizon of crypto exchanges. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Great to be here. And welcome to my fantastic panelists. Um, have a seat, please. So thank you for being with us today. A new horizon, the future of crypto exchanges. Uh, what a exciting topic and I'm very happy to welcome you here uh, for this uh, vibrant uh, discussion we're going to have. So we have uh, Robert from BitTrue, we have Anton from KuCoin and we have Basil from MidChains here. So please give them a hand uh, for being here on stage today. For people to learn a bit uh, what were your ambitions to actually start in the space of uh, operating in a crypto exchange, uh, what is your background a bit, uh, maybe a quick introduction about yourself, your personal motivation to start in the space. Robert, uh, what brought you uh, in, in, into the blockchain and crypto industry? Yes, yeah, so I spent a long time in alternative assets, um, so hedge funds, private equity, and then I was asked to come and look at you know, the firm and represent it. and so. For me, at the moment, it's about looking at how we improve the business and where it's going. Um, what can be done to make it better? And then, you know, what are the challenges it also faces too? So that's where I've really come from it from. Lovely. Hi, yes, thank you for having me today. So my personal story is kind of a little bit complicated. I came to crypto in 2018 and uh, it was, you know, like uh, the toughest crypto winter as we had at that time. Nobody believed in crypto at that time. And also uh, I was in charge of uh, building one of the biggest mining forums in Kazakhstan at that time. So uh, I came to crypto through, you know, through mining and then I was really curious about that and then I just learned more and then I decided to try my best at the top crypto exchanges as uh, when I'm working right now. Thank right. You. Lovely. Thank you. Basil? I think uh, like my colleagues here on the panel, um, also background in private equity and hedge fund and then started to do some research into really the applications for tokens, crypto into the financial markets. and noticed that a gap in 2018, which was the year we started as well, uh, was, was actually doing it in a regulated marketplace and, and doing it w under the right regulation, which didn't exist at that time. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how we started as well. That's exciting and actually it uh, follows a bit the discussions I had uh, earlier today and yesterday uh, with your background in private equity, TradFi. Uh, actually, what I'm curious about is to understand a bit what is your view when we speak about the crypto exchange. Most of the people think about Bitcoin, ETH, ADA, Solana, and uh, all the, the given facts. But obviously, there is a, an amazing amount of potential investment opportunities which are not directly crypto related as the broader mass knows it today. And speaking about the tokenization of assets, I uh, had another panel speaking about real world asset tokenization. Uh, what do you see as an opportunity for a regulated exchange when it's about actually having uh, more tokenized assets uh, as a product offering towards uh, the, the retail investors, but also the wealth managers? Maybe. After you, Basil. <laughs> 
So my view on this is that I think, you know, ultimately we shouldn't be thinking of ourselves as a securities exchange, a commodities exchange, FX exchange, or a crypto exchange. Reality is, is that if we're able to sort of tokenize property, we then become a property exchange and allowing counterparties to settle property between each other, regardless of what that underlying property is, so long as there is support from a legal framework to allow that to actually happen. Yeah, I mean, like legal is uh, very important stuff as well. Uh, in KuCoin right now, we are paying a lot of attention to tokenized assets, this kind of uh, investment activity class. Uh, we believe that it could bring like more uh, potential investors to uh, the space and it could drive, you know, mass adoption, as we all know. So, uh, and also, in my personal opinion, it could democratize the process of investment because, you know, like it doesn't matter where you are or what do you do. It's like very easy to have access access to this kind of uh, investment tool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what we have right now. And like to summarize it, like we are working on uh, offering uh, tokenized assets uh, solutions, investment solutions for our clients right now. And we will have announcements uh, later on this year. Okay, exciting. Thank you. I think for us it's a case of you know, what, what, would you, what do we bring on, um, bring on board? And you know, we're always looking for interesting projects to bring on, um, but you know, how far down the road are they? So it's quite important, and then you know, looking at where do they fall in, and I think one of the biggest challenges is ensuring that there's enough information about those, you know, what's been tokenized, what's what the project's related to, and how it's actually going to help or be valuable to someone, mm. um, which could often get lost because if not, it's just another, you know, another three-letter word coin that's going up, and people go, oh, great, great, what's different about this one? And you go, well, oh, it's you know, see, if, you know what I mean? So yeah. if you don't have that, then it's just something else, and I realize it's quite a dry subject, you know, the future of exchanges, but it's also quite an important subject too. Yeah. Um, you know, most, most people have got a project, they want to do something good, you're like, well, where are you going to plan to raise capital for it? How are you going to get it to market? Where is it going to be applied? How do you want to raise awareness of it? Um, you know, that's what we all do beyond just being somewhere where you can buy and trade. It's like, well, there is a broader uh, offering or broader service that the exchanges provide. Um, which I can think gets forgotten. Um, and to, to Basil's point, which is a, is a good one, you know, you're right, your, your exchange changes with every different token that you have because you know, depending on what it relates to, you know, it has a focus on what, what people come to you for. Yeah, yeah it's this evolution, right? When you look at a traditional exchange, you're very much uh, have uh, the securities regulation, you know, the list of products you, you have uh, actually to, to offer or to, to get listed. Uh, while here, yeah, it's actually, it's dynamic, right? So it evolves and this is also something which is exciting then when you speak about the accessibility, the inclusion that you can actually provide access to investments which did not exist in the past. So especially private equity and these type of things, they were limited to a certain amount of, of professional investors and uh, now we are opening up this market uh, to the retail investors. And uh, this definitely, I can imagine, is hard from a regulatory point of view for you. Uh, how how is is this uh, is there a close interaction with the local regulators or how do you uh, work on the different jurisdictions? Looking at as an example, the U.S. Uh, with, with the SEC, which is very strict uh, on it, versus Abu Dhabi, who has a, a fairly good uh, DLT law in place. Um, Basil. So U.S. is one of those jurisdictions that we look and learn from and admire, but stay away from in general. And I think most of us on the on the on the panel here probably agree agree with that. Within uh, if our main markets are international, so as far as uh, mid chains is concerned, we started our journey in Abu Dhabi in particular because in 2018 there was no other regional regulatory body that was even entertaining any conversations with uh, virtual asset players under any capacity, with the, regardless of the business model. And so, you know, going down that journey, fast forwarding now six years almost from ground zero, which I, I can, you can tell I have some trauma from it. Um, we are holding about nine licenses for different activities across the UAE in particular, uh, in order to serve a wider, more international customer base, but also be able to service the different products and services that we have um, that you would c come to expect from a crypto exchange, for lack of a better way to describe it. And I think what's become complex in the space is that it's, it's not one or two licenses that solve the problem anymore. You now have to go out and collect them and mm. collect them for every new asset or product or service you want to launch. Um, and that's where I think it's not efficient. 
Yeah, from our point of view, it's also a very long-term game as far as we see it, because you know, like it, it takes us like a lot of time to to have regular conversations with the uh, different regulations in different regions. Um, and right now we have a separate team and it's getting bigger and bigger like each month as far as I know because you know like as as we all know right now the only way for centralized exchanges as we see it is uh, you know to embrace the regulations so that's why we really prioritize uh, working with the uh, you know regulators in different uh, areas and different regions regions around the world that's how we see it it's a constant work and it's a very long process, but uh, I think that uh, in the upcoming year, uh, all of maybe like top exchanges will follow this path as far as I see. Yeah, yeah I think it's a case of which markets you're in, which ones you decide to not be in. Um, to Buzz's point about the US, you know, you have to look at places and go, well, is it worth it? You know, is it worth the money to be involved here? Do we have enough customers here to justify it? Or do we just turn it off? Um, you know, is there, I mean, the US can't even decide what crypto is. So that that's a, makes for a sticky sticky point. But so I think you've got to pick in you know, a certain places where you would really want to be invested uh, and, and look to win there. And then some places you just have to sort of ign not ignore, but um, you know, interact with in different ways. So I mean, the UAE is an, probably an interesting example for BeTrue. It's like, well, are there enough customers here to justify having a huge presence of marketing here and going for a license? You're like, well, probably not. But in terms of the people that are here, the companies that are here, uh, the VCs that are here, it's definitely worth interacting mm -hmm. with. Um, so it's, you know, is it about industry engagement, not just about customer acquisition? Yeah. And uh, do you feel there is a progression, because what Basel said, right, it's, it's very inefficient the way it is today. So by having a bit more uh, educational driven approach from various institu institutions like uh, associations, but also like for, for Cardano with an academy, we, we driving the education with the regulators. Do you feel like there is willingness and openness to actually improve this process? Or how could we as an industry support each other to, to make it more uh, accessible for, for, for everybody? So something I've thought of for some time now is, is having an exchange summit. So just getting the, the large exchanges around the world together in a room and saying, look, we all share these common problems. Um, I mean, there are 500 exchanges in the world, 250 recognized exchanges, but being realistic, the top 50, 60 are the, are the ones that count. Um, and I think that's one way we can do that is, is discussing these problems and then talking to regulators, not individually, because let's be clear, you know, CZ and, and Binance are taking a lot, of the, a lot of the heat, you know, because they're the big boy uh, and they've got so much market share that people want to hit them. And so, you know, that's good for us because we're like, yeah, you, you, you go and deal with the US regulator and we'll carry on being over here. But eventually, you know, they're going to go, well, we've done, be, you know, we've, we've done Binance now, so who's below that? And who's below that? And who's mm. below that? And, you know, eventually they're going to get to everyone. Um, so it's, a, it's an issue we're all going to face, um, depending on where you are, of course. And so, <coughs> you know, I think we clearly have to work together. Um, but, you know, it takes doing things like this to get in the room with people to be like, hey, you know, we don't have to be adversaries here. Yeah, we're after the same ends and we do the same thing, but we can do it in different ways and we can do it together and we can do it better. Absolutely. So uh, it's, it's not the competition, but it's rather combining forces to actually help understanding how the market can uh, evolve and change for the better. I think yep. just jumping in on this one, I, I would say the industry has done a phenomenal job compared to a few years ago, just in, its ter in terms of its level of attempt to regulate, or sorry, to educate regulators and to educate the broader community. That's definitely there. But I think, unfortunately, we're also a victim of, <coughs> of what's trendy. And I feel like, you know, it's, it goes without saying that half the people I knew in blockchain a year ago are now in AI. And I think that regulatory sentiment, if you look at down to the individual regulator, they need to be genuinely passionate and interested to learn about the subject in order to implement proper regulation for it. And I can't say that that's always the case, unfortunately. Yeah, and I would also like to add that that this kind of uh, forum, this kind of panel, it's an it could be a, like a first step for exchanges, you know, like to communicate, to be more transparent. Because I really think that we are all doing like the same thing, and we should like exchange our views and help each other, you know, sometimes share resources in some ways, because we are all in the same boat. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah. I, I th if I might add one thing, I mean, every regulator has got different things that it wants to achieve. You know, so some of them it's about tax collection, 
and that could be at an income level from the customers below. It's not about you, it's about what's below that. For others in the UAE, you know, talking to the guys here is like, well, what we believe in is the technology below it, so we want to enable it. So that's an enabling. For the EU, it's like, well, we need consistency across the block, because if not, we can't, you know, we can't come to you and, and be against you or for you if we don't know what it is you know, you're expecting to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you know, every regulator seems to have its own slightly different take on what it wants to achieve. And some of them want to achieve all of those things, but they don't, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's then the question, right, how, how fast can you get there? So yeah. doing one by one, it's probably the better approach than uh, going for <laughs> the, full, the full list. But yeah, speaking then about actually following the trends uh, and, and regulation, what is your... Uh, how do you see the impact of the potential uh, approval of the, the Bitcoin ETF, uh, which is uh, how we discuss these days? Is this relevant for your region and for your client base? What is the impact of listed products? If I look at the perspective from the region itself, I think there's pros and cons. On the pro side, it's, it's validation of the industry and I think we're all going to see a rally in the market when more and more assets come into the space. Mm -hmm. That's universal, no matter where you are. But in terms of is it relevant to an, an investor that sits, lives, or operates an investment company in the UAE? No, it's not relevant at all. And it's not relevant at all because there's perfectly good access to the spot asset directly in country. So unless they have a specific mandate that, does, that prohibits them from necessarily investing in spot crypto or the ability to manage their own wallet or a custodial account with a, a proper virtual asset custodian. That's the only reason I would imagine they would look at to say, okay, I'd rather get an ETF share than, you know, a, a share of a Bitcoin. Yeah, like for me personally, I think that it could bring more, you know, retail investors, institutional investors into the field. And, uh, you know, like, to be honest, I think that uh, for a non-crypto user, like, uh, it could be a signal that our, you know, industry is legit and everything is fine here. You can play here. You have your set of rules here. So uh, sometimes, you know, people out of the crypto industry, they think that uh, our industry is like Wild West, you know, like it's not a secret for all. So I think that the main impact that Spot, uh, Spot Bitcoin ETF could have is uh, to attract more retail investors, in institutional investors, also bring more liquidity. Uh, liquidity is always good for, uh, for a market. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the, my, the main point of my. You mentioned the wild, wild west, right? So it's yep. people don't understand actually how the technology stack behind works. But actually, when you look at the uh, capability we have with forensics, with data analytics, uh, what, what are the surveillance tools you have implemented to monitor transaction and actually comply with regulatory uh, requirements, but also demonstrate uh, how the technology can actually provide a better framework than the, the traditional uh, financial system? Robert. Well, I mean, if I might avoid that question and go back to the previous one, uh, I think I have a very different personal view on the ETF yeah. side, um, <laughs> which is that I think it actually proposes a potential risk to exchanges. Um, Basil and I differ, differ on that. And I think the reason for that is if you can go to BlackRock um, instead of going to Binance, I think people are going to do that. Um, clearly not everywhere. You know, I take your point. You're like, well, we're here. It won't affect us here. Like, sure, but if you're a European, you're probably going to go through Vanguard or State Street or uh, Man Group, you know, these big asset managers, because they're not just going to stop at Bitcoin. If they get a Bitcoin ETF, it will be an Ethereum ETF, and it will, it will keep going down and down and down, down the list. And people will go, well, if I can buy everything here, then why should I go to an exchange? So clearly, exchanges won't lose um, you know, some of their value because you know, the people will still be trading coins that other people don't know and pairs that people don't have. So, from that point of view, that's a good thing. Um, but I don't think it's a clear case of, yeah, it's, it, I, th I agree, I think there'll be appreciation, like more people come in, but at the same time, I, I don't think it's a really fantastic thing, you know, start spraying the champagne around either. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I don't disagree with you. So I, <laughs> I think okay. in, in general, from a European standpoint, that makes complete sense. But I would say that, you know, at some point, somebody has to buy the spot asset for the ETF yeah. to work, right? So it, it, it's, it's going to be a change in who the client base we cater to um, is at the end of the day. And at least from our perspective, we've always been more of an institutional focus group. I mean, most of our client bases, at least 99% are, are qualify as corporates and institutions. 
And you know, we have noticed a trend this year of moving off of exchange and into OTC, which is, it's fine, but it is a change in business model. So I do agree with you on that. Yeah, I mean, like, I just, I have my own point of view on that. I think that it could drive more you know, investors into the field. I know me personally, I have lots of friends from, you know, traditional financial sector and they all waiting for, you know, that spot Bitcoin ETF to be approved because uh, traditional investors, they like to have this kind of clear and transparent rules for the game. So that's why I, I'm kind of not really optimistic about that, but I'm more optimistic about that, like 80% if we're talking about percentage, about spot Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And how do you see the competition uh, with the DeFi space when we speak about DEXs? Is this, uh, how do you see the evolution and the development towards the future? How will this work together? Or uh, how, how, is there any incentive on your side to actually have a combined offering? Or how do you work uh, on this behalf? So Beecher actually uh, co-owns a DEX called Wingriders, um, which it doesn't do that much trading. And I think it's 90% on CDX and 10% on DEX. And I think, you know, <coughs> if people talk about dark money being in crypto, then, you know, if it's on CEXs now, then it will move to DEXs in future. Yeah. Um, so I think my personal view is, you know, we're a very large CEX, and that's our focus is to, re is to, remain, to remain that um, and have an international presence and not, not to be regional, not to be truly global, but to be, to be international. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know most of our efforts and resources and time are being spent on pushing the CEX side, not the DEX side. Yeah, my opinion about uh, that, it's like, um, you know, we are still very early. As far as I remember, if I'm not wrong, like less than 10% of the world's population are using crypto right now. So the main role of centralized exchanges, as I see it, is, you know, to be user oriented and to provide a huge variety of user friendly crypto uh, products as if, if we can say it like that. So that's why I'm not really worried at this stage of this game about, uh, you know, mm, centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges competition. Uh, for me personally, in the future, uh, I believe that it could be a coexistence model. If you are just, you know, like an ordinary user, you can use centralized exchange and enjoy this kind of, uh, you know, easy to access features and uh, all of that, you know, fancy interfaces, customer support and all that stuff. Uh, but if you are more like, uh, you know, advanced user, so of course you can go to DeFi, to decentralized exchanges and use your decentralized solutions there. So for, for the future, I think it could be a hybrid model, a coexistence of those two types of exchanges. And for KuCoin, personally, we, uh, we are looking forward to attract more decentralized financial products into our ecosystem. And uh, yeah, so if you guys have any good projects, you can contact our listing team. We are basically very, very looking into that right now. Yep, thank you. Thank you. I agree Nothing. with everyone here on the on the on the point of being kind of an access an access window into DeFi for those that want it as a as a CeFi exchange. But I think the role that at least we play as an institution is the on and off ramp. That's yeah. what we're best at. And I think there there isn't any real direct method to do this as a DeFi group purely. And so it'd be difficult to get that regulated and have banking for that kind of an institution. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenge we all still face as exchanges in the space is banking yeah. it's to this day. And I think I couldn't, I can't imagine myself six years ago thinking, oh, six years from now, banking still going to be a big issue. <laughs> we've, you know, as an institution, we've solved it for ourselves, but it's, it's not without a lot of hard work and great relationships that we're able to do that, yeah. which is not the case in other industries where it's just, okay, we see your license, here's your bank account, go ahead. It's not the same in our industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's uh, definitely to, to drive the adoption, make the change. Uh, we, you need to have the, the banking uh, fully integrated as well. And this uh, is something where we see as well, uh, there is a lot of work needed uh, and again, uh, education to actually bring people on the right level that they can use and that it's scalable as well. That's another question, right? The technology uh, cert at certain aspects needs to be scalable for actually these industries to, to adopt and have the right tooling kits. What is the innovation you see 
being driven uh, in your respective uh, organization uh, right now? Where do you have the key focus on in the future development at the very moment to uh, create a difference in, in your service offering compared to another exchange? That's all for me. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, apart from new entering new markets, uh, it's clearly have to be a focus for us. I think longer term, I think what we, what Btree needs to do and what many of the exchanges will have to do is, is step into some of the services that traditional finance offer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and where that falls, you know, does that fall into uh, alternative assets, you know, wider alternative assets? Does that fall into uh, some elements of investment banking? Does it, it fall into wealth management, real estate? You know, where does it fall into? Uh, I think that's you know, where we've got to get to is improving, improving those bits. But let's be clear, you know, we still need to get things right now. So you know, we're still <laughs> trying to improve things today, let alone uh, down the line. But I think that's you know, entering some of that space is going to have to be some of it. All right. Basil? The focus will always be getting more and more licenses and bank accounts because at the end of the day, that's the lifeblood that enables us to perform our business activities. But I mean, it's, if we're talking about innovation on, on our side, outside of those two aspects, um, I do believe <coughs> in the multi-asset class exchange vision. I think we're getting closer to actually achieving this with legal and regulatory frameworks that are now evolving to the point that are allowing this. That's always been our goal, at least you know, since we started out to say, this can't just be a crypto exchange, it has to be an exchange. Yeah, I just want to add something that during this bear market, I think it's it's extremely important for crypto exchange to invest into its infrastructure. So that's what we did. We did a lot of uh, behind the scenes work, if we can say it like that. For instance, we have updated our futures trading system. Uh, right now it's like uh, 20 times faster than before and 30 times bigger in terms of capacity. That was our main goal during the, that bear market, you know, to to keep building and to you know to prepare for the future uh, upcoming bull market and also about our current plans for upcoming month uh, our number one priority would be a uh, kucoin card uh, because you know our users they have uh, you know huge requests uh, they they've been asking us a lot about guys come on please we need a card because we we used to pay with cards we need our own card okay so our card will be ready like in upcoming month or two uh, that's the number one priority for upcoming uh, quarter and also uh, right now we are busy with uh, you know incorporating AI solutions into our trading bots uh, and also into our mm, customer support. We are experimenting with this uh, kind of stuff right now and uh, it, it gives us good kind of results already. So uh, also what we would like to do, what we plan to do this upcoming month is to list as many good projects as possible. If you check our KuCoin exchange right now, you can see that this week, as far as I remember, we have already listed like three different projects. So that's our main goal for upcoming quarter, upcoming month, to support and to, you know, to develop the projects that survived during the bear market. That would be our top priorities for upcoming month. I think uh, it's important you said survive the bear market. So I think here is actually where you can see a lot of the quality projects, right? Those who have a proper business plan and yep. actually can operate even under those circumstances. Absolutely. So and also one more thing that I want, would like to add, it's very important to, you know, to do your homework as an exchange. I mean, to do due diligence because, you know, there are a lot of uh, scam projects and all other, you know, like suspicious projects in industry. So it's very important to check the background of each project. Uh, what are you listing, you know, because you're in charge of your users. So, yeah, yeah that's what I want to add. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. And pe people trust us, you know, that's part of the reason why a centralized exchange. Yeah. People trust you. So if they can't trust what you're putting out the door, you might as well not be in business. Or you need to go and be in a different business. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I mean, everyone, everyone can improve on that. I'm sure you guys do a great job at that. <laughs> but I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not questioning anyone, but you know, it, it, it is true. It is true what you say. Yeah. And uh, earlier, Basil, you mentioned as well uh, OTC trades and we heard the bear market. How much is the demand uh, actually towards derivatives to actually as well have capabilities to hedge uh, properly? Is this something where you see a lot of demand uh, coming? That's a great question. I think conversations have been had, but I would say you're not seeing that many transactions actually being executed on the hedging side. 
I would say some institutions will come and say, hey, can we have a, a yield bearing solution or a Bitcoin? We want some op options, some structured products. But when it comes time to pull the trigger, no one does it, yeah. um, at least not often enough. Um, we've seen this with a lot of the, the hedge funds and market makers out there who have been thinking about putting out products like this. We're supportive of it, but the demand is not material yet, I would say. There's still some time before that happens. Like That's maybe after ETF, that might happen. Yeah. I was just to say, do you think that I, I get the same, I get interest on OTC, but then I think to myself, you're just price gauging somebody else. You're just, you're keen to get a price so you can find out whether what you've been given already is something you can go forward with or not. Potentially, but the other one is that certain institutions that you might work with don't want the slippage that they might see on an exchange. And they would go the route of OTC to have that fixed price, even if they're paying a little bit more for, for let's say, a, bl a larger block trade of, of three to five million dollars as long as they know they're not going to get any slippage because for whatever reason they have something else on the other side that they need to have that fixed price for. So those, those do come along mm. and we are seeing quite a few trades like this of that nature. Um, but I would say that sort of more structured, more complex products, not really. It's just simple block trading at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally, I'm waiting for this to see then as well, uh, more complex structured products, exotic options uh, coming around. Uh, but what, what, I, what I see or what I have heard a lot is uh, right now is a bit as well then, how do you manage actually the whole collateral management uh, depending on your jurisdiction, where you're working in, and this is where the banks come in, right? So if they have uh, capital requirements which are uh, 800x, uh, then it's obviously very difficult. What is your experience? Is this still a key issue for you to actually banking or uh, how, how is it in uh, Abu Dhabi going it back to you? The Austin? banks have never been sort of a capital issue. It's always been more of a compliance issue. And, and, and not to say that, that, that we're not necessarily aligned from a compliance perspective. As a regulated institution, we are. It's more about the risk appetite of the bank itself as it operates. In many cases where I think, you know, we look at what's happening around the region in particular, and I think this is shared in Europe, um, is that a lot of the local banks are getting pressure from their US dollar correspondent banks to avoid banking any kind of virtual asset service provider, whether that's an exchange or a hedge fund or an asset manager. And, and there's a couple of correspondents in particular that are, that are the guilty parties and a few that are quite supportive. And so it's more around navigating this complexity in the banking industry to find the right partners and actually work with them effectively for on and off ramping. You know, like for, because I'm in charge for CIS region, CIS region is a very, you know, uh, different region in terms of regulations. So it's very hard for me to answer that question because the policies are very different, so, you know, like in each region. So yeah, I just pass it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, I guess it's a consideration when you're applying for stuff, mm -hmm. but I guess the amount of collateral you need to put in isn't the end, be all and end all either. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Again, I agree with Basel. We agree with quite a lot. Mm. <laughs> quite a lot of stuff. Lovely. And uh, common, what is... Common problems. <laughs> yeah. And what is a bit the, the, the outlook? Uh, how do you actually prepare? What is the strategy? Uh, and uh, what is your prediction uh, towards actually what is, what is going to happen? Uh, how do you prepare uh, your... your not only the product offering, but also the organization to deal with the, the hopefully upcoming demand, uh, increased demand uh, in assets, uh, but also in transaction. Is, is there a specific strategy you are building on and you would like to share with us, um, Anton, with KuCoin, what, what, what is the strategy? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. As far as uh, I mentioned that we have invested heavily our into, your, um, into our infrastructure right now. So basically our main focus was futures trading. So that's why we have upgraded our futures trading system as far as I mentioned, it's bigger and faster right now. And also our mm, one of our key priorities for upcoming years, it's, uh, you know, like to, to hire more talented people who could like you know not only have a crypto related background but also can speak like different languages who could have uh, connections uh, you know in different regions uh, which are priority for us and also one of our top priorities is to key our communities uh, to to grow our communities sorry mm. yeah uh, yeah that's how I see it. okay 
Is finding talent difficult uh, these days? Actually, yeah, it's quite challenging because, you know, the person should be, as far as I mentioned, like multilingual, should understand crypto. Uh, it's better to have some financial background. It's better to have some uh, relations with, uh, you know, regulators and stuff like that. So that's why it's a little bit challenging right now. So that's why our HR team, they are very busy <laughs> currently. I I mean, for, from our perspective, I guess it's looking at, you know, where do we go into a, a new market? How do we do that? Is it organically? Is it through, you know, building a community? Is it about buying another exchange out? Uh, what size do we buy? How much do we spend on that? Um, is the market deep enough to warrant buying mm -hmm. out something? Or do we look to try and do, a, a, you know, decent joint ventures? Um, but again, going back to the very beginning, it's about picking certain places to be involved. And then, you know, looking at, you know, how do we activate that through partnerships, through influencers? Um, you know, where should we spend money, where shouldn't we spend money? I think what the exchange is, is sort of in, in banking on is, um, sorry, not in banking, banking on is, you know, the end of the bear market, which is, I think has already happened, has happened some time ago, uh, and is the increase of a, of, of a coming of a bull market. But where that, where that ends up being, um, I think, you know, we're positioned and ready for that, whichever way it goes. If it goes the other way and it stays bare for a long time, I mean, there's way too many exchanges. <laughs> Even if you're a regional specialist or a country level specialist or an international or truly global, there are still too many. Um, so, you know, those smaller exchanges that don't have a lot of quantity, don't have many customers, I, they're going to collapse. I, 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 don't, well, I don't wish it on them, but I just look at it and go, well, I don't, I don't understand how you're doing this. Yeah. They, you, 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 <laughs> you know, it's going to go at some point. It's commercially not viable. It's commercially right viable, yeah. yeah. And I mean, even, I've even looked at a few in the UK that are like that thinking, well, UK is a decent market, but it's not that big a market. And I look, you go to conference and you think, well, you've got 20 people here, like, you know, just in a partnership team, like you're one country. So how does that work? Um, so I think you know, for me, there's too many exchanges. It's going to really boil down. So um, there will be if, a if consolidation happening, uh, which will then as well strengthen, obviously, uh, again, those who are well established and, and have the right uh, quality uh, management tools in place and the right talents. Basil, from your side, uh, Speaking about talents and, and the, the, the strategy. So it's been interesting to see the UAE really become, you know, a big player as a crypto hub, um, not just as a as a place for companies to come and set up, but for a place for talent to come and live and actually migrate and work at and work from. You know, it helps that we have a certain tax regime here. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm the beneficiary of it being in Emirati from Abu Dhabi for my whole life, so I can't think of living any other way. <laughs> um, but it, it's been. It's certainly a lot easier this year to recruit talent, quality talent, than it used to be. Last year, you were effectively working at one of two firms without saying their names, and if you were, if you, if you were not paying the same level as they were, you could not attract talent. That is not the case. I think the market has adjusted. It's been good um, for, let's say, smaller regional players who have managed to perform during this, during this bear market and adjust and adapt. And I think innovation, for at least from our side, is going to come from doing things that are not necessarily exchange-related activities. So one of the things that we've been developing heavily is actually a acquiring and payment system. And the reason we've looked into this seriously is because we are believers in CBDCs. We are in support and in favor of the UAE CBDC, which will come out um, likely in the second half of next year. I think that's a wonderful way to kind of diversify revenue streams that are not necessarily pegged to the cyclicality of the crypto market itself. Wonderful work, thank you so much uh, as well. Time run off unfortunately, but I think uh, it was a good way to close as well the panel looking at where we are going to. So thank you very much uh, for being here today uh, to give us insight uh, and sharing your expertise. Looking very much forward to follow up and see how we can collaborate and help each other. And I'm inviting any, every one of you as well, please be part, uh, help uh, the change and yeah, speak with us, exchange and uh, create, create the value for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.